to Midday Live on TV3 with me, Martin Isidu Dati. Coming up within the next one hour. Ghana Immigration Service deports Chinese woman Huang Yangfeng, who was standing trial for illegally transporting rosewood to China. Also in the bulletin, workers of uh, Metro Mass Transit in Kumasi on a sit-down strike will be crossing over to find out what exactly their reason is. On the foreign front, an attack has killed up to 40 migrants at the detention center uh, um, outside the outskirts of Libyan capital Tripoli. Details of these stories and sports business all lined up for you within the next one hour. Stay with us. All right, so we'll go to our very first story where the Ghana Immigration Service has deported Wang Yangfeng, also known as Helen Wang. She is the Chinese woman who is standing trial for allegedly transporting a large quantity of rosewood to Tema for export to China illegally. Um, she has been deported, we are told. Here is a news desk report. Wang Yanfeng was deported for engaging in illicit business while in the country and subsequently revoked her resident permit. A notice signed by the Controller General of Immigration, Kwame Suyatichi, informing Wang of the decision read that she's hereby informed that her permit to remain in Ghana has been revoked, therefore her continuous presence in Ghana was unlawful. The letter said the Controller General of Immigration acted in accordance with Section 21 of the Immigration Act 2000, Act 573. Head of Public Affairs at the GIS, Michael Amuakwata, in a statement noted that the service had also informed the relevant institutions, including the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, as well as missions abroad, to refuse her visa to facilitate her entry into the country in future. The Tamale Circuit Court, presided over by Justice Chumisi Apia, on May 13, granted journalist Mohamed Bondegiribon stood surety for one Yemfeng bill in sum of 3,000 Ghana cities with two sureties. Mohamed Bondegiribon was also given two weeks to produce the suspect who had disappeared after initially being granted bill. On Tuesday, June 25, Wang appeared in court. She was then referred by the court to the Ghana Immigration Service for her document to be looked into. The court then acquitted Mohamed Bondirigbon. Wang was later transferred to Accra for further investigations. Let's stay on the subject matter a while longer. We've been joined on the line by Dr. Rashid Haruna. He is an international relations analyst and we want to find out from him really how does this play out on the international community front? Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for your time. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Is there, I mean, from your expertise, do you think there is this sort of an agreement between Ghana and China, for which reason we are unable to prosecute persons that come into the country and blatantly flout our laws, where we just ask them to leave the country? Is there any such agreement, well, do you think? No, there, there's no such agreement where, uh, bilateral agreement where it allows uh, a foreign national to come into sovereign Ghana and flout our laws and desecrate our uh, environment and then leave. You know, no, there is no such agreement. And, and usually what happens is that by a national agreement, when you are in a country, you respect the laws of the country. Right. When you are caught doing something wrong, you have you go through a due process. You are given your day in court, and you go through the, the, the due process. And then, however the judgment comes, then if you are acquitted, of course, then you have you are free to leave. But if you are not acquitted and you are found guilty uh, as a result of the, the court proceedings. Then you have to uh, abide by whatever the the law says in Ghana. But to have this lady, and in fact, she's not even the first one. If you mm. recall, Aisha Huang, yes. had the same thing, and for some reason she was whisked out of the country, right? And she did not stand trial. And then this lady, who is supposed also supposedly her sister, mm. we are having the same thing. And then ironically. 
Hello, Doc. We seem to have lost uh, Dr. Rashid Haruna on the line there. He's an international relations expert, was trying to help us understand what the possibilities could be, whether or not there was that kind of an agreement between Ghana and, and China, or maybe any other country where, you know, their citizens come into our country, break our laws, and all we do is to just let them leave. And uh, maybe what then, from the expert opinion, would be Ghana's stance? If we prosecute these persons in the country, uh, could it hurt the relationship we have with these other countries? Uh, that was actually going to be my next question. But uh, we'll uh, try and raise him back on the line and conclude that interview. You know, I mean, so if you're just joining us, the latest is that the Ghana Immigration Service has deported um, Wang Yang Feng, who uh, we are also known as um, Aisha um, Huang or Helen Helena Huang. I beg your pardon. And uh, she was stopped. Uh, are the ports for illegally transporting rosewood. Now, there is a blanket ban on the cultivation of rosewood any, in any part of the country. But she had come into the country, cultivated it, but uh, quite several containers filled with rosewood. And she was just about uh, moving it from the northern part of the country to the ports and then out of the shores of Ghana. But she was stopped before she could do that. Uh, Dr. Rashid Haruna uh, has uh, joined us again. Thank you very much for reconnecting. So the, the, the next question I was going to ask is, um, if we actually do take the decision to prosecute these persons in Ghana, do you think it is going to mar the relationship we have with any international uh, country, um, specifically China? Absolutely not, because, I mean, they all understand, if you go to China, if a Ghanaian goes to China, and he breaks the laws of China, they are subjected to the laws of Ghana, to the rigors of the laws of, Ghana, uh, of China, and they are taken through court, and whatever the court decides is what the rules is going to be. And that is exactly what happens in the United States and anywhere in Europe. So just because someone uh, is tried in Ghana, as long as we give them the due process, they are presumed innocent before you know, uh, they are pre presumed innocent and not just guilty, you know, um, then they go through the process and whatever the decision is, I think mm -hmm. international law respects that. So no, just because we take a, a Chinese national through the course does not, uh, it's not going to impact our bilateral relations. And then we've had very good relations with China for a very long time since what does, uh, the, the, the 50s. What, what yeah. does the, the constant deportation well this is the second such one that our eyes have caught yes but what does a constant yes. deportation you know say about us does that question our sovereignty you think well you see you ask a very good question what it says about us those who are involved in doing this is that somehow we do not respect our own laws we are not standing firm to prosecute people for, you know, breaking the rules in Ghana, especially when it comes to environmental issues. You know about, you know, climate change and this rosewood and other type of wood. It takes years, decades yeah. for them to grow. Right. And these laws have specifically been told that you cannot do this. So for us to allow not just one person, and also the other uh, one, uh, Aisha Wan, also had to do with uh, the environment, yes. with this girl I'm saying stuff, and then this other lady with our wood. So yeah. it just tells people that we are not serious about our mm -hmm. laws, and it does not speak well for us. For us. It's Thank very you. bad. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rashid Haruna. Uh, he is an international relations analyst and helping us understand what, what could actually even ever happen between Ghana and China if we had decided to prosecute Helena Huang here in Ghana. So she has also been sent out of the country or deported, um, the technical term would be. Same thing was done when we uh, finally found out Aisha Huang, who was destroying our water bodies and engaging actively in uh, Galamse, illegal mining. She was also deported. So for how long would we keep deporting people who have come into the country to break our laws? And uh, what, are the, what do the laws say when a foreigner is arrested breaking the law? 
we seem to be doing something not quite right. But I would want to speak also to Daryl Bosu, he is a National Programs Director at Rocha Ghana. Um, they have also raised a few concerns regarding um, the, the decision by the Ghana Immigration Service to deport the, the, the lady in question, Helena Juan. When we do get him on the line, we would uh, put a few questions to him. But uh, do also let us know what your thoughts are on this news that uh, actually came out earlier today regarding the deportation of um, Helena Huang, who has left the shores of the country. And uh, when we do get him, we'll ask them, him those questions. Let's move on to some other stories now. Going up north, because uh, Tamale North Member of Parliament, um, Ahasan Suhini, is questioning the president's silence on the alleged torture of a modern Ghana.com journalist. Describing it as shocking, the legislator noted attacks on journalists under the akufuado led government is a matter that has to be taken seriously. I am scandalized by the levels at which officialdom is going to, you know, frustrate and reduce the media space. I think it is sad, it is condemnable, it is immoral, and maybe to add, it's dishonest. Dishonest because the man who is in charge of this country today, where we are recording all these things, was touted as a human rights champion, was celebrated as the one who took the bill to parliament to get the criminal libel law repealed. And so to have, you know, authorities use legislation, authorization, licensing, and protocols to clamp down on critical media and go beyond that to not raise a finger, at least to the admiration of all when a journalist was gunned down under very mysterious circumstances and again to you know um, not really give a direction when another critical journalist was forced to flee this country for his safety and now to have you know media men tortured to the extent of being electrocuted some heart because we are told that they got shocks in their manhood. I, I just can't believe that this is Ghana in 2019 under a president, a human rights champion, a lover of the media, Nana Akufado. I think his image is on the line and I call on him to intervene and to, you know, give us hope that all is not lost. He's not the only member of parliament who has commented on this. Let's also bring you a chronology of other attacks that have, um, you know, hit journalists in the last few uh, months because we are keeping a tab on this latest development regarding the recent attack on the, um, the journalist who works with uh, Modern Ghana. Uh, com is a website. Their office was you know, broken into, and then the national security operatives carried them. That is the latest in the, on the list of attacks that have uh, occurred on journalists. So that happened on the 27th of June, uh, just um, a, a few days ago. And then also, on the 14th of March 2019, a Ghanaian Times journalist was brutalized by the Ghana Police Service. On the 17th of January this year, Ahmed Swali, who works with Tiger IPI, the investigative body, was shot dead in his car. That issue is still on the minds of many, very fresh. In May last year, uh, that's 2018, the 14th specifically, Ahima Sechiwa was slapped. And this was a, a lady who was uh, a journalist, was also slapped because she was doing her job. She was in the line of duty. Same year, 2018, on the 27th of March, Latif Idrisu of Multimedia was brutalized by some policemen. And there seemed to be a consistent uh, you know, attack on journalists, which doesn't seem to be going away. So of the total, 17 attacks have occurred. And these are just the few that we would want to you know, bring to your attention. And following these recent attacks, specifically even the death of Ahmed Swali, Ghana has fallen um, four points 
in the 2019 rankings of the World Press Freedom Index, which is an indictment on us as a country because we have been touted as a country that is pushing press freedom. You know, but now, unfortunately, that credibility about the freedom of the media is dropping and waning under a government that is pushing for freedom and development, which is actually their, their mantra, that's the NPP government. And many are calling on the president, that's Ananadu Dankwe Kufad, who is known as a human rights advocate, a citizen rights advocate, and then someone who has been pushing for freedom of expression, that under your government, there seems to be an increased attack on the media and journalists for that matter. What is your concern? Why does the presidency seem to be quiet on these developments? And what do you also think? Do let us know on our various social media platforms. So we are monitoring the latest with the modern Ghana journalists. They went to court yesterday and um, uh, that case has been adjourned. We'll keep you posted when we do um, get them uh, also. So uh, there seemed to be something not quite right. And uh, certainly when it, ha it does happen, we will bring it to your attention. This is still Media Live on TV3. Uh, let's stay with issues regarding the media and management of the GBC has denied that a deal between the cooperation and uh, KBL over its GBC Govern channel is an outright sale. In a statement, in a written response, the Corporate Affairs Directorate insisted that the GBC Govern channel has been turned into an account channel with the sole objective of making profit. However, the response failed to state the rationale behind uh, money it is alleged to have received from KBL for the deal. The response from the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation explained that a measure of GBC Govern and GBC 24 as GBC News is to maximize profits. The free channel, the response said, is only being run in partnership with KBL as an Akan language television. The MOU, the response maintained, allows GBC to provide the platform and the personnel to run the station and produce programs while KBL will provide equipment, content and finances. The response, however, declined comment on what aspects of the partnership warranted the alleged cost of $350,000 negotiated and why. It also did not explain why the private company has begun operations with a brand name Adrimpa TV outside GBC. The investigative team gathered from unimpeachable sources that GBC management only reported the deal to the board subcommittee on projects and programs after the deal was sealed. The subcommittee we gathered raised questions about why they were kept out of the negotiations. Again, there is indication that GBC intends entering into similar deals for some of its channels, including Obonu TV and GTV Live. Chinese company Star Times, we are reliably informed, is also in talks to take over GBC Sports Plus. An earlier statement reacting to these concerns, however, said the Gavin Channel has not been sold. It added the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation is a state-owned organization and as such management does not have the authority to dispose of any assets belonging to the state without recourse to government. It explains further that the other channels, namely Obonu TV and GTV Live, have equally not been sold to Magdan Group of Companies and so is GTV Sports Plus. GBC's dealings with Star Times, according to the statement, is only related to the Ghana Premier League rights. TV3 can state that there are a number of crucial meetings in the coming days involving the various stakeholders on this controversial matter. The board of GBC, for instance, is meeting on the matter on Friday following a stiff opposition by the GBC staff union. Again, the National Media Commission, NMC, is set to meet management of GBC over the matter this week. Efforts at getting a reaction from KBL owner and CEO of Jospon Group of Companies, Joseph Sienwe Japon, have not been successful. He is yet to respond to calls and direct text messages to his phone. The Information Minister, Kojo Pong Kruma, responded to a call at 10 a.m. Tuesday but opted to respond to a text message which we are still awaiting.
and we'll certainly keep an eye on this story and keep you posted when we do get it. And as part of the, um, the issues surrounding attacks on journalists, we are told that the Ghana Journalist Association, the mother body of almost all journalists in the country, that's GJA, is holding a press conference at the um, press center uh, later today. We'll bring you what the GJA has to say about recent attacks on journalists and the profession. All right, let's go to the Ashanti region now because workers at the Kumasi depot of Metro Mass Transit are on a sit-down strike over what they uh, describe as poor working conditions. The workers are also worried about the poor conditions of the buses which break down on almost every journey. Our Ashanti regional correspondent Beatrice Piogabra has joined us from the depot to let us know what really uh, the situation is like. Um, Beatrice, good afternoon and thank you for your time. Um, has any bus moved at all and what are the drivers saying? Good afternoon to you. I can say that no bus has moved from the terminal to any part of the country this morning. Wow. But passing just from outside the Ashanti region who boarded buses um, were dropped. That is, they, 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 the buses brought them to the terminal, but moving from Kumasi to other parts of the region or other parts of the country is not um, happening now because no bus has moved this morning. And some other commercial drivers have taken opportunity of the, the sit-down strike to come to the terminal to load the standard passengers, whom some had been there from 4 a.m. going to other parts of the country. And when the drivers say poor working conditions, what do they really mean? Well, the, 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 the challenges according to them are many, but if I can mention just about one or two. The first one is about the buses that we think that we drive. Most of these buses are in bad condition, so anytime they move, the buses will break down along the route and they will have to fix them before they continue their journey, and this for them is causing a lot of revenue to the company. So they want new buses to be given to them, although they admit that last year they had about 50 buses added onto the fleet, but it is not enough. And when it comes to their conditions itself, they are saying also that for three years they've not had any new salary increments, despite a number of appeals that their salary should also be increased. And when you go on a journey and you sleep over, um, the drivers are saying that they are giving 10 Ghana cities a sleeping allowance. And they are alleging that the management has deployed the services of some mischief passengers or monitors, as they decide to call them. These uh, mischief passengers or monitors have been employed by the company. And when they sleep over, they are giving 40 Ghana cities alongside um, hotel accommodation. Right. But for the drivers, they will have to sleep in the buses. And these are all some of the issues that they think is um, alerted management that is on fair treatment, but nothing has been done. So, so until the agreements are addressed, they are not going to wait. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, we believe that you would uh, bring us the latest in our subsequent bulletins. Beatrice Pio Gabra is uh, our Ashanti Regional correspondent, monitoring that story for us. Let's uh, shift our attention to some other stories. Now, the Minister of Environment, Science and Technology and Innovation, Professor Frimpong Boatin, says government has no intentions of an outright ban on the use of plastics in the country due to the wide usage and contribution to the economy. The sector minister at the media press series um, here in Accra also indicated that the government would not be able to enforce a, a ban on plastics. Plastic manufacturers, they, they produce only a small percentage, a relatively small percentage of plastic that are used in Ghana. And there is no plastic that is bio, entirely biodegradable. The point is that there's, as far as I know, there's no plastic that will disappear, cease to become plastic, and then become some, some carbon or some water or something. We are a year and a half ago, we were under pressure to ban plastics in Ghana because certain countries in Africa have banned plastic, so we should do the same. Um, we think that. We should be very careful in the way we, we, we do that because if you ban something and you're not able to monitor and police it, what do you do? So we have drafted a very important plastic policy 
which is not cast in iron. The policy has two components. We have a resource, a resource recovery secretariat, a secretariat that would be manned by people from my ministry, from sanitation, from local government, from the private sector, from plastic manufacturers, and those who use plastic. And they will make sure that at every particular time, the policy will be monitored and steps taken. Um, but let me go forward a little bit. To make this possible, you need resources. And the government has now set up the plastic levy. And the bank account has been opened at the Bank of Ghana. And this levies, uh, people who import plastics will have to pay some small levy which will be deposited in this account. And that money will be utilized in doing a lot of things that we want to do. Uh, plastic recycling and so on. But in managing plastics, we think that a wholesale ban will not be in the interest of Ghana. What is the minister talking about? Really? Okay. I mean, it, it is quite a debate as to which level of plastics should be banned. But um, a lecturer at the Institute of Environmental Studies, Professor Chris Gordon, says there should be a gradual approach to banning the plastics. Yes, we should ban. Should the ban be an overnight ban? No, I don't think it should be an overnight ban. There should be a, a phased out process simply because the plastics had a purpose, they had a use. We need to have substitutes. We need to encourage manufacturers to do paper bags as we used to have in the past. We need to have people who produce bags made of materials that we can take to shops and put our shopping in. We need to educate the people who, and that is all of us, who use single-use plastics on the dangers of using it to wrap kinky before boiling, the fact that you don't need to have four different plastic bags to pack your uh, kinke, your fish, your shito, your uh, fresh pepper in one bag, then in another bag. We have to do that education first. Otherwise, this any outright immediate ban will not work. All right, so that's Professor Christopher Gordon there. And we also hit the street to find out from you what you thought about this uh, comment by the minister, and this is what some of you had to say. Some have argued that one of the most effective ways of dealing with the waste menace in the country is to ban plastics. But the Minister of Environment, Science and Technology says Ghana will not be banning plastics anytime soon. What do you think? They should find an alternative means for that because um, you know, plastics take time to decompose. It takes so many, many decades to decompose in the soil. Papers don't deco easily decompose, they, they easily get rid of and all that. So I think that if we can move to the paper, it will help than the plastics. It will take time because you know, it has been existed for some time. So it will definitely take time. But I think if they also really want to do it, then they can also make sure that they speed up the process to make sure it's done. We cannot ban plastics completely. Um, but. I think there are some plastics that we can, we can take out of the system and rather go in for paper. So our supermarkets, um, the little shops in the corner, they could go in for the paper instead of the, the plastic. But then if the levy too is, is going to be a deterrent to some companies and I think not just the levy but to make sure that social corporate responsibility is also adhered to by especially the water producing companies, um, the plastic producing companies, that together, hand in hand, that will work. The sanitation issue is something that should be tackled from the root, the hopes. We can levy the producers of plastics, for example, so that we can use that fund to clean up, at least for now, maybe when we start, with time, we can get uh, some other thing to, 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 to go back. It will be better than not doing anything at all. The levy that they take, if they will use it to do what they are taking the, the levy for. But if they will not use the levy, then, then they should ban it. But if only they will use the levy to 
you know, to minimize the, the usage of the, of the, the project. I think that one is okay. What do you think? Do let us know your thoughts as well. Let's go to the courts now. Because lawyers of Zoom Lion have accused the Auditor General of denying them their right to be heard before surcharging them to pay back uh, an amount of over 180 million CDs that was paid to them by the National Health Insurance Authority, NI NHIA, for fumigation services. The information we also have indicated that according to the 2015 Auditor General's report, a fumigation contract between the local government ministry and Zoom Lion, a subsidiary of the Jospon Group of Companies, owned by Joseph Sian Ajapong, um, received payment that were not due them. It was the contention of the lawyer for Zoom Lion, Safo Boabing, that though the contract expired in 2012, the two maintained their contractual relationship, which implied that Zoom Lion and the health ministry still had the contractual agreement. A situation that caused them to continue the execution of the contract with the ministry through the NHIA, which verified the work done and accordingly paid. Salam Amanya is our man in court and will be bringing us a uh, further and better particulars on that story subsequently. Our MTN video report for this afternoon, our citizen journalist Martin Simon wants government to commence the use of an abandoned health facility at Jeritinga in the northeast region. This is a village near Nalirgu called Jeritinga. This building that you are seeing here is a clinic which has been built here for about two years now but nothing is happening over here. The people in this area is crying day in and day out just to have access to health care. So I just want to on behalf of the people of this area appeal to the government to come to their aid so that this particular clinic would be would open for work to take place so that they will also have access to health care over here in Jargitanga. Reporting for TV3, this is Martin Simon from Nalirgu. You can also send us your MTN video report on the WhatsApp number you saw on the street. Well, just in case you didn't write it down, it is 055-1433044. Send us your video and we'll be happy to put it out for the rest of the world to see. Stay with us. We'll be back with more on Midday Live. Thank you very much for staying with us. Let's do business now. Only 2 million out of 15 million active working population in Ghana are covered by the Social Security and National Insurance Trust, SNIT. These active working population receive less than 650 CDs as pension benefits after retirement. The Institute of Fiscal Studies, IFS, gave the figures after a research it conducted this year across the country. The research by the Institute of Fiscal Studies was conducted between 2000 and 2014. It revealed 2 million out of 15 million active working population are covered by SNIT pension scheme. It again showed that 5.4% of the contributions came from the private sector, while the public sector contributed 12.3% to the Social Security and National Insurance Trust. The research again highlighted SNIT spends 1.9 million cities to pay benefits of those above 60 years. It again identified that those on captivity who are numbering over 70,000 above 60 years receive chunk of the benefits. The Institute of Fiscal Studies has suggested that government should roll out measures to enroll the informal sector on SNIT pension scheme. Its executive director, Professor Newman Kusi, called for amendments of SNIT laws and other initiatives to reduce the financial burden on pensioners. The national identification system is done properly. You have the database based on which you know who is who, 
where he's working, where he's staying, what is his age, and what time is he going to be able to retire. And therefore, based on that, we're able to develop a proper and comprehensive you know, social security system. Director General of SNET, Dr. John of Osutin emphasized on improved salaries for an enhanced retirement benefit. In the same way as salaries are adjusted annually, Mr. Chairman, the SNET pension payments are also adjusted annually to ensure that the purchasing power of pensioners is maintained. This year, the indexation of pensions resulted in an increase of the pension wage bill by 212 million Ghana cities uh, for pensioners on the pension payroll as of December 2018 for the year 2019. So that's all for business on Midday Live. Let's go to that all-important campaign that we have been waging here at Media General, uh, which has to do with the Garbage Out campaign. So we're going to Johnny Hughes, who is at Big Base. If you hear the name of the place, he tells you how serious it is. Johnny Hughes, what can you report? The Garbage Out campaign is out here at Big Base in the Ablikuma West constituency of the Greater Accra region. There are two main schools of thought. One that says plastics must be outrightly banned. And the other that says that plastics really is not the problem, but the management of plastics is really the problem. Now, yesterday, the Minister of Environment, Science, Technology and Information, the Professor uh, Frimpon Boatin, speaking to pressmen at the press conference, hinted that Ghana was in no way uh, on any time soon going to ban plastics. Now, that has started a big deal of conversation, knowing full well that in 2015, ex-president Muhammad mentioned that we would have to go the way of Rwanda by banning plastics as they have done in Kigali. Subsequently, we're told that plastics, flexible plastics of less than 20 microbes was going to uh, be banned. Now, if you take a look around, you will see that uh, plastics all over. This used to be a canal that connected straight into the, the lagoon, the estuary, and drained into the Gulf of Guinea. The United Nations had mentioned that some 9 billion uh, tons of plastics had been generated. <laughs> We apologize for the transmission, the poor picture quality, but uh, clearly the story is being told by Johnny Hughes, who will bring us an update from Bibese, where he has been uh, since morning. All right, uh, let's go to Parliament now, because the Member of Parliament for Kaikwe Central, Patrick Yabuama, has registered his displeasure on the decision of the Parliamentary Service Board to construct a new parliamentary chamber. Speaking to the press in Parliament, the Member of Parliament says a decision will make the government unpopular. He says this decision should materialize after 20 years. We are 275 members of parliament. We are going to have a population census next year. I don't think we have an inadequate number of MPs to discuss member, uh, matters of national interest. So maybe in the next 20, 30, 40 years, when we are okay with our developmental activities, we can have a monumental uh, edifice as parliament. I think the timing is wrong. I think there are more pressing things that we ought to look at as a parliament. Now, the public is not looking at this issue as a, a parliamentary issue. They have, they've taken it as a governmental issue. And I don't think the government wants to be very unpopular with a decision that the Parliamentary Service Board has taken. I belong to the executive. I'm a member of parliament as well. And my position is that I don't think the timing is right. Ghanaians have uh, a lot of pressing needs that they would want us to address and with the government of President Akufuado is attending to seriously. We don't want this issue to distract government and its activities and programs. Uh, so my view is that I have a lot of challenges in my constituency. How am I going to answer a question of this nature that uh, the few things that I'm fighting through government to 
get done in my constituency. I overlooked it and rather focused on a new chamber. I think uh, first things first. Yes, going into the future, we can think about it. All right, uh, details of that story will be on our website and then also in our subsequent bulletins. But uh, uh, that'll be it for now. This is still made live on TV3. So we mentioned earlier that um, the Ghana Journalist Association, GJA, was going to hold a press conference about recent attacks on journalists, specifically the, the most recent having to do with the modern Ghana journalists who were arrested and, according to them, were tortured. A uh, reporter on the ground will be joining us shortly to let us know what exactly is being said at that press conference. Uh, before that, though, time now for international news. All right, so before international news, let's go and find out what is being said at that GJA press conference. Journalists, uh, media owners, and editors that I can spot within the well. Um, my job is to give you an update as to where the matter is now and then perhaps what I should be more comfortable with is to take your questions. So yesterday I was contacted by the One Ghana Movement, who I understand have been providing some sort of shelter for one of the reporters in question. And their request to me was to see if I could make myself available to assist, because the reporters so far had not had legal counsel through any, everything that had been done. Mr. Arthur Money and also uh, Mr. Ken Ashibe, I'm sure you know him, gave me the needed encouragement. I left my job in the midst of doing a, a, a process in court and I sought for the reporters to be brought so I could have conference with them. I met with them and I got to hear their story at first hand. As a practitioner, I needed to do my job more professionally. So I took them through a series of what could give me the assurance that due diligence was assured. And after that, I assured myself that they were not a group of dishonest journalists who had a hidden agenda to do some uh, bad image uh, storytelling. <coughs> they were to appear before the police at 2 p.m. So I led them there and subsequently just when the meat of the story is coming out, we have to cut in. But then details will be in our subsequent bulletins. Okay, so that's it for the bulletin. It came your way from our studio here at Adesawe in Accra. My name is Martin Esirudati. Thank you very much for watching. There is more news on our website, 3news.com. Do visit and get updated. Good afternoon as always. Stay positive. Bye for now.